I'm going to mention which other Halloween movies this one references. So if you consider that a spoiler, then I would tell you to go watch this movie and then come back to this video. You have been warned. So let's talk about the atmosphere of actually going to see this movie. I want to go see this movie in Altamont Springs at the AMC Theater with the Dolby surround sound and boom seats, which is really cool. And let me just tell you, the best crowd to see a horror movie with is a crowd with black people in it because we react. Cool thing about Dolby sound is that it's so loud that even as we react, we're not being louder than the movie so no one can complain and say, oh, you're talking through the movie. Plus, audience reaction is pretty much what a horror filmmaker wants. Horror films are meant to evoke a reaction from people. So hearing people gasp or say, don't go in there, it's just an added bonus of watching it in the theater, in my opinion. Question, is this really just called Halloween 2018 or is it H4O? Because I've seen on Twitter, H4O was trending. Or maybe that's just what the, the people are calling it. My crazy behind was sitting there waiting for Mustafa Akkad's name to pop up on the screen. Instead, Malik Akkad's name popped up on the screen. I'm guessing that's his son. And then at the very end of the movie, they did put... Um, dedicated to Mustafa Akkad. In case you happened upon this video and you hadn't seen my previous videos, Mustafa Akkad is the producer that produced, I'm pretty sure he did three through Resurrection if I'm not mistaken. His name usually appears before the title card of Halloween and so that's why I was looking for it. I'm sure if you're new to my video you're probably thinking this woman is such a horror geek. Why would, who looks at producers names? Me? <laughs> As we saw in the trailer, a couple of journalists slash podcasters show up to the mental institution because they want to talk to Michael. I don't even remember if they ever said why besides just getting content for their podcast. That seems like a bit much just for a podcast. One of them shows or tries to show Mike his mask. He acts unbothered, acts, and then they go on their merry way. Then the asylum staff say they're preparing to, wait for it, transport Michael. Because that's what they do in these movies. They try to transport Michael and he escapes. That This is like, what, the sixth or seventh time they've tried to transport him and he escaped. But we're, supposed, we're not supposed to remember that because this is a direct sequel to part one, remember? And they've only tried to transport him twice and he's only escaped twice. Once Michael gets loose, you know what he has to do. He's got to go and kill a mechanic because where else is he going to get his jumpsuit from? He, always gotta, he has to kill a mechanic and get his jumpsuit. There's a, you know, a scene where he takes care of some people and then he gets his mask back. You knew that was going to happen. I mean, that's not really a spoiler. They kind of show that in the trailer. Meanwhile, we get reacquainted with Lori Strode. We see her home and how she spent years preparing for the very day that Michael gets free. Then we meet her daughter, her son-in-law, and her granddaughter. Her daughter is still very resentful of all the tactical training that her mother forced upon her in preparation for the time when Michael gets loose. The son-in-law provides some comedic relief and it actually worked out pretty well and it's really no surprise seeing as this was co-written by Danny McBride and don't you find it funny that two of the best horror movies of this year was Get Out this year or last year? I think Get Out was last year. My bad. Two of the best horror movies of the past two years have been written by comedic writers but it kind of makes sense because the one thing that horror and comedy have in common is timing you have to have great timing for comedy you have to have great timing for horror and suspense let's talk about the kids the granddaughter is caught in between her mother's resentment for her grandmother and her own love for her grandmother we meet the granddaughter's friends and they're actually pretty likable teens i liked how they shot them walking together in the same way that Lori and her friends were walking home except they changed one thing instead of doing the classic american shot from the knees up they altered it just slightly and it's more from the hips up but still same result great shot i like the conversation about how michael killing a few teens is not a big deal because these are current day teenagers and in their world they have to deal with mass shooters and school shooters. These are kids that have to do active shooter drills in their classroom. So just a few people being stabbed is probably lower on their scale of atrocity. One of the kids babysits the cutest little boy named Julian. He is the definition of a precocious child. He really stole the show. The young actor's name is Jibril Nantambu. And I looked up the first name. Um, it's an, well, in Arabic, it's an archangel. I thought that was kind of fitting because he, he was such a cute, he was the cutest little thing. And again, if you've seen the trailer, you know what happens to her. This movie has some great shots. The point of view is back. 
those great wide shots are back. Some of the scenes with the podcast, there's a shot real up in her faces. You know how I feel about that. I don't want to be so close up in an actor's face that I can count their nose hairs. I don't even like myself sitting this close to the camera, but I'm working with limited space. Anyway, the lighting is great. We get to see the shape in all of his glory. One of the best lit sequences is the part with the mental patients outside of the bus and the father and son that are going hunting. That whole sequence is shot so beautifully. That also had some great suspense and a great aftermath shot. And what I mean by aftermath is sometimes they don't show the kill, but they show the victim after the kill and what has happened to them. And there was a shot like that in this sequence and it was done very, very well. What I'm going to do is I might put a couple of shots at the very end of this video and I'll put a spoiler alert before those for people who have seen the movie, just so you know what I'm talking about. I actually don't mind how they mixed that up because we saw several kills on screen and then we saw several aftermaths on screen. The practical effects work were very good on these. The mask looks great. If you look at this, the eye holes are cut well. I don't know whether I remember to mention this in H2O, but I felt like the eye holes were cut too big. I know it's a tiny thing to notice, but for me, I felt like the eye holes were cut too big. And this one, the eye holes were cut just right. The eyebrows are not too dark. The hair looks as if it would on a mask that's 40 years old. Nick Castle came back to record his breathing and to advise the new guy who plays Michael. He showed him how to correctly do the head tilt. By the way, that's James Jude Courtney that played the shape in this and he did an excellent job. Haddonfield is integrated now and I really loved seeing all the black people that live in town. Incidentally, Halloween has not always been the best with that. Friday the 13th has always had a more diverse group of kids. I mean, Friday the 13th was on that diversity stuff way before it was a cool thing to do. They even had a differently abled person in a wheelchair. So, I mean, when it comes to diversity, Friday the 13th kind of wins that. Nermino Street jumped on that around, um, Kincaid was in part three and he was in part four with uh, Sheila. And then in part five, I can't remember the girl's name, but she was played by Oh, Kelly Jo Minter. Don't remember the character's name, but I remember Kelly Jo Minter because Kelly Jo Minter was in um, Nightmare on 2 5 and she was in The People Under the Stairs, um, Mask, I feel like there's something else I'm forgetting that she's in, Popcorn, um, Mask is in a horror movie, but the other three were horror movies, so she's a certified Scream Queen because as I said before, three or more horror movies makes you a Scream Queen. But like I said, Nightmare on Elm Street, their diversity was just barely there, but they did it. Friday the 13th was the best. Halloween wasn't really diverse until age 12. I, yes, not until age 12. So this is the most diverse Halloween we've seen. And it's it's representative of a lot of places in America right now. It's just, it's just what it is. And it, I love it. That's one of our country's strengths. Don't at me. Remember what I said about no small parts, only small actors in some of my previous Halloween reviews? The award for that... For this movie goes to the brother in a cowboy hat. I could not find a still shot of him, but he was just oozing with with charisma as he walked around with his cowboy hat on, smiling and chewing scenery. Like he was not forgettable. His character, even though he was on screen for what a minute and a half at most. I also liked the homages to the previous Halloween movies. There was lots of homages to the Halloween movies. I'm gonna read them off my phone because there's no way I can remember all this. I had to take notes. The police refer to Michael's original rampage as the babysitter murders, which was the working title of the original Halloween movie. It was called, the working title was the babysitter murders. There's a conversation in a cemetery that features Judith Meyer's uh, tombstone, headstone, gravestone. What do you call it? Is it a tombstone, a headstone, or a gravestone, or all three? Someone let me know in the comments what you call that. But there was a conversation in the cemetery that reminded me of the one from part one. There was a clothesline featured. A character obviously you saw in the trailer was dressed as a bedsheet ghost. If you blink, you'll miss them, but there's three little children that walk by dressed in the silver shamrock masks from Halloween part three season of The Witch. And I got so happy when I saw that. I don't know why. It just, I got a kick out of it. And the public restroom scene definitely is reminiscent of the public restroom scene in Halloween H2O. That's all I can remember offhand because I was in a movie theater. I couldn't take notes on my phone. So that's what I got from memory. If you notice some other homages that were paid in this movie, please write them down in the comment section below. Uh, write in caps, spoiler warning, and then uh, space like three 
times down and then write it in case someone happens to look, you know. The writing was really tight and you could tell that the writers, um, David Gordon Green, Danny McBride, and Jeff Fradley actually really love and respect the original movie. Unlike Rob Zombie. They know what made the first movie work. There was some criticism about the first half of the movie being slow. I disagree. The first half of the movie is called something, um, and I'll let you in on a little secret. It's something that a lot of movies used to do, and um, it's this thing called character development. Speaking of characters, there is a Dr. Loomis type individual. He's like Loomis in that he worked with Michael Myers and he's obsessed with Michael Myers, although his motivations are completely different than Loomis's motivation. David Gordon Green directed this and he did an awesome job of keeping the feel the same as the original without making it feel like it was too copycatish. The writers and director understand that slasher movies are mystery suspense thrillers with elevated violence. This shows the most with the sequence with Lori walking through her house. That's all. I'm, that's the only way I can describe it without spoiling it. The tension of that sequence had my stomach tight. There's also a bit of a role reversal that happens in this movie and I really got a kick out of that. Another thing that made this movie so good was that John Carpenter came back and did the score. Remember I just said how, remember how I just said that in H2O and Resurrection they kind of flubbed on that because they tried to be original and change the score but the music used in both of those movies just could not top John Carpenter's score. I believe John Carpenter also executive produced this alongside Jason Blum. There was a teenage boy crying outside the theater when we came out and I don't know whether it's just that the movie was that shocking to him or whether he had some type of um, sensory issue that maybe was triggered by the Dolby. It's hard to tell sometimes whether a person is emotionally affected or traumatized by the movie or whether he had special needs that made the Dolby experience too much for him to handle. This movie was pretty good. I can't wait to own it on DVD or Blu-ray. By the way, check out this cool crew pick. These should be included on every movie on the IMDb page. Also, please do enjoy this funny picture of Laurie and Michael Myers. And before I go, I'm also gonna pay, oh, spoiler alert. So click off this video if you're worried about spoilers. I just have to post these pictures of some really <laughs> cool practical effects work that was done in this movie and you can't do that without showing the outcome for a certain character so check this out this is just I you know I love practical effects so you know I'm gonna love this like I always say just because I like something doesn't mean you'll hate it and just because I hate something doesn't mean you won't like it <laughs>